say we're going to completely ignore our PowerPoints. Yay. We're going to jump off the idea of arrays for a little bit. I want to talk about the string builder class and why you might want a string builder class. Being able to treat an array, excuse me, a string as though it were an array is a cool thing that we can't do in Java. Now, when you say you can't do, it just means that the language doesn't provide, you know, it in a built-in fashion. For example, what if I did this? String s is equal to, you know, Bob. And then later I wanted to change that O to a U. It'd be neat if I could do this, right? S1 is equal to U, right? It'd be neat if I could take that first character and turn it into a lowercase letter by using, you know, some ASCII trickery, something like this. S sub zero is equal to the character version of the int of S sub zero plus 32, because adding 32 takes something from lowercase to uppercase. Right. Vice, vice versa. Adding 32 takes it from uppercase to lowercase. So after we did those things, it would print BOB. Now this is valid C++ code. Wouldn't work in Python, wouldn't work in Java. The problem is, is that in these languages, strings are known as, are what is known as immutable. Once you create a string, that's all you can do it at. You can use it, but that's it. You can't change it. You can make a new string, like you could do this, S plus equals, you know, space Roberts. So it'd be Bob Roberts, right? You can make a new string like that, but it's building a brand new string. It's not changing the data of the one that said Bob. It's creating a brand new string. So it out. You know, here we have three bytes that are allocated. And then instead of just adding on however many more bytes that is, eight more bytes to it to get 11, it's creating a brand new string that's of 11 bytes and still somewhere out in memory is this original data. So strings are wasteful if you're going to be changing them a lot. What if you do something like this? And like I said, this code absolutely does not work in this language. Just know that. This is C++ style. It would work. What if you did this? For i int is equal to zero, i is less than uh, 10,000, i plus plus, and we did s plus equals exclamation point because we think that his name is so awesome it needs to be followed by 10,000 exclamation points. That is going to create 10,000 new strings. One that's like 11, one that's 12, one that's 13, one that's 14, one that's 15, and so on. It's an extraordinarily slow thing to do. And you use up, temporarily, a whole bunch of memory. Then Java garbage collector will come and notice that you have a bunch of strings that, you know, that are, are no longer being used. And maybe it'll release them from memory, so hopefully you won't run out of memory while it's doing that. You could, if you change this to a large enough number, right, because it's allocated, you know, string after string after string. What if this is 100,000? Then it would allocate one, you know, that was 50,000 long, and then it would allocate another one that was 51,000 without freeing the last one, allocate another one that's 52,000. Right, you know, it's, it's kind of like a summation. You'd wind up with an impossible amount of memory being used. So, Java gets around the fact that strings can't be changed, that trying to append the strings uses up way more memory and is much slower because, you know, it's actually constructing a new class object every single time you do that. And the fact that you can't do cool stuff like that. There is a class designed, just like we have the wrapper classes for doubles and floats and integers and stuff like that that give additional powers to you know, ints and floats and doubles, like the ability to convert, you know, to parse and to read a number in as a hexadecimal number or format it as, you know, something anyways. You know, so we have those cool wrapper classes that give extra powered up abilities to those primitive data types. 
although a string is not a primitive data type, there's still kind of a wrapper class that gives it extra powers. The ability to do all this kind of stuff. And manipulation is done all clean. It's done in a memory efficient fashion. If you wrote a stream builder version of this, it'd run lickety split without hardly using up, you know, too much memory at all. Performance is dramatically better if you use the stream builder class. And I've never taught the stream builder class, but I kind of thought that it's, you know, useful enough that I wanted to stick in your head. That's why I'm going to spend the day talking about it. Something else that would be cool for us to be able to do to that string. You know, what if I wanted to say s.insert at position 10, you know, is awesome. Well, it's position 10, who cares what that is, right? I can't do that either. Strings are immutable. They don't have an insert function, right? They don't have a change function. I can't do s dot replace, you know, the thing at character zero, you know, with a new string, you know. Really awesome, right? Or, you know, at least replace one letter, right? You know, it'd be cool if I could do that, right? It'd be neat if the string class had all the methods to do that kind of stuff, and it doesn't. The stream builder class does. So, that's what we're going to learn. I forgot to bring my notes on the stream builder class, but that's okay. I'm going to make a new project. I need to remember what lecture we're on. W. W. Oh, no. We're almost at the end of the class. We'll just have to quit at that point. X, Y, Z. But we're not. Okay. Lecture W. So down in Maine, I'm gonna and I'm gonna have to add the import by the way. I believe it's in java.lang. So I could go up and manually add include java.lang .stream, string builder. But you know, NetBeans makes us lazy. So string with a capital S, B with a excuse me, builder with a capital B, no spaces, S B is equal to new string. Builder, parentheses, in parentheses. You know what, that syntax is cool and all. But it sure would be neat, don't do this, if you could just do it like that, right? And it would make a brand new object of that type and you wouldn't have to specify the constructor or whatever. In the C++ language, to make a new object, you just do that. But in this language, it just creates a reference to the object and not the object itself. Okay. La -di -da. There we go. We have a new string. Let's start adding some things to it. How about a for loop that will add to our string? Print i is equal to 0. i is less than 5. i plus plus. Oh, apparently the string builder class. Oh, that's right. Everything in java.lang, L-A-N-G, is already automatically included. Now, for some reason, in the examples I was looking at, they did pound sign include java.lang.stringbuilder anyways. But that's why we're not getting an error there. Okay, and let's append something to our string. sb.append, parentheses, h-a-h, space. And at the end of it, let's print it out. System dot out dot print line SB dot T O two the word two string with a capital S parentheses in parentheses. Now honestly we don't need the dot two string. Every object can be converted to a string. Every object has a two string method, but Java will usually do the conversion for you. For example, since printline wants you to send, you know, strings to it, then if you do SB without putting that dot two string to it, it'll still call two string behind the scenes. Anyways, I just kind of want to remind ourselves that SB is not a string, but it can be treated like one in many, many cases. You can get a string out of it, right? I could do over here. I, I'm going to type it and probably not bother. You know, string S2 is equal to SB.2 string. Now, I can't imagine what I'm actually going to use that for. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, 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 I'll do that. There we go. You don't have to do that. You already have it. Good. All right. It printed out. Ha, 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 ha. What if we want to insert something into the first position? The syntax is a little bit different than you've seen in other languages, but it's close enough. I say that. We'll find out. Let's insert. So sp dot insert parentheses. I want this to be a position zero, so it'll go into the end, the uh, beginning of the string. And what we're, we're going to say is, I don't know, hello, period, space, space. That, that way, by the time we're done, SB is going to be equal to hello, period, ha, 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 ha. There we go. So we're able to manipulate it by doing sp.insert. How about deleting something from it? Maybe we don't like that H. Or maybe we want to change that H to a J. And here's where I wish I brought my notes. Sp. It's not a pen. Is it replace? Yeah, it's replace. SP dot replace, starting up his index zero, going up to index one, and put a J there. Now, why did I do this zero comma one business? This specifies the first part of the thing we're going to replace, which is that one. And this specifies the last part of two, but not including one. So if we do zero comma one comma J, it's just going to put a J right there. But if we did zero comma two, it would replace both of those with a J. Right? And if we put zero comma four, it would replace all of that with a J. Now let's print it out after we do that to make sure it looks the way we expect. So system dot out dot print line. SB. I'm not going to call true string because, like I said, when it needs to be converted to a string, the dot to string method is called automatically. And we, I don't think that we've been adding too many two string methods to our classes yet, but you can. All right, that did it. That replaced the J. Now let's replace the entire word hello. What index values am I going to have to use for jello in this case? Well, that's index zero. One, two, three, four, five. Up to, okay, zero, one, two, three, four, five. That'll do it, right? So if I put zero comma five and replace it with goodbye, then it's going to say goodbye, ha, ha, ha. Let's do that. SD dot replace, not place, replace 0, comma 5 with goodbye. Now notice this isn't the same length as that. That's fine, right? It's okay. It's just like highlighting a word with our mouths, hitting backspace to delete it, and then pasting in goodbye there. That's kind of neat. That's kind of a neat thing to be able to do, I think, you know. You could replace, you know, one letter and put an entire, you know, sentence in it. Or you could replace an entire sentence with one letter. You could even use that just to delete. If you replaced with an empty string, then it would have removed that J completely. I believe that to be the case. All right. I forgot to print it out. Alrighty, goodbye. Ha, 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 ha. Now we can access each element of this. Oh, so yes, sir. I just want to 
to make sure that length of whatever you're replacing it with doesn't make a difference, right? Like you could have 20 character lines. Exactly. This could be goodbye, you poor fools, right? And then when I run it, there we go. Okay. Yeah. And what happens if I replace it with nothing? My guess is that that'll work just fine. It's just going to say exclamation or period. Ha 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 ha. So we can access each character with dot care at. Now, honestly, the string class does the same thing, so, but you wouldn't want to leave that functionality out, right? So if you want to print out the first character or get the ASCII value of the first character, you could do that. Care space ch is equal to sb dot care at zero. That would be the first one. I'm not sure what we're going to do with that. Maybe we're going to make it a lowercase g. And I already mentioned that to take something from being an uppercase g to a lowercase g. You just add 32 to its ASCII value just because that's the way the ASCII table is set up. So let's do that. CH plus equals 32. Now, the first time I looked at the string builder class, I didn't see a way to replace a character. You could replace a string. I didn't see a replace character. Then I looked at it again, and I think it's there. So let's look at the help, the uh, list of things. SB dot. Let's, what is this called? Replace character? Set care. That's cool. That's what we want, set care. So SB dot set, capital C H A R, position zero, like that. Ooh, and what do you know? I got an error. Cannot find symbol. Didn't I just see it? Was it not a capital C? Dot set care at. Oh, it's got the word AT in it. Okay, so set care AT, set care at. Position zero, CH. So the next time we print it, it's going to be a lowercase g. And then maybe we're going to iterate through the entire string, making all the letters uppercase. This is all stuff that would be flat out impossible to do with a string class in this language. To do this kind of stuff otherwise, you'd have to use a character array. And then rebuild your string at the end of all that in order to print it out. Like we did in one of our assignments, pretty sure that we did. We, right? we converted a string into a character array so that we could play with it a little bit. All right, and as always, I forgot to uh, print it out after I did that. Copy paste, run. It's lowercase g. Let's run through it and replace every lowercase letter with an uppercase letter. Now my brain's going to glitch on this. I may make a mistake. We'll find out. All righty. So I wonder if this syntax works. No, I'm not going to even try the I wonder if this syntax works stuff. All right, for int i is equal to 0, i is less than sb dot length, parentheses, in parentheses, semicolon, i plus plus, right? So we're iterating through the string builder one character at a time. Let's get the character out. CH is equal to SB dot care at parentheses I. Oh, I need to put the uh, word char character in front of this. So CHAR space CH. Oh, no, I didn't because it already exists from up here. My mistake. Okay, so I just deleted that. 
C H is equal to S B dot care at parentheses I. And let's see if we can convert it to upper. And I've kind of forgotten how to get the upper value of a sh character. Is there a, a is there a string? Is there a character wrapper class? C H. Isn't it dot up to uppercase? There you, there we go. Okay. We had to use the wrapper class, but that's cool. You know, that's why we have wrapper classes to give us extra powers. Character dot two upper clay K C H. Now we could uh, do it ourselves. We could see if it you know falls between the values of you know this and this, and if it does fall within those values, then subtract thirty two from it. And that would, you know, make them all uppercase, but hmm, whatever. And now let's set that value. So SB dot set care at. Set care at I comma CH. And if we wanted to write a slightly hairier statement, we could do that in one line of code rather than in three, right? We didn't have to store this in a temporary variable. I'll show you what it would look like, but don't type this. SB dot set care at I comma. I'm just going to do some copying and basting to get this done. There. That would do it in one line of code. Neat, huh? All I'm doing is, you know, I took that. And I put that there, and then I took that, and I replaced it with that. Right? You can kind of see how it's all nested. Works, but my goal is to not write code that is as confusing as possible. So I'll leave that alone. And I'm actually going to remember to print it out this time before I run it and notice. I accidentally put my print statement in the loop. And so it's successively oh, that's a neat idea. I want to see that. I'll put my print statement in the loop. And so we get to watch the progress of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. I like that. And so if you were doing one of those projects that involved, you know, doing something with the ASCII value, like doing the uh, Caesar cipher, or doing the one where you or exclusive or a ASCII value with another value. Your loop for modifying your string might look like that, right? You might run through it, except you wouldn't be doing two uppercase. Instead, you'd be, you know, doing an exclusive or, or some kind of rotating on it, whatever. That's one way to do it, right? You don't, you absolutely do not have to use a string builder to do any of the, uh, the projects. If it makes it easier, cool. Every time I've written those things inside uh, it, with Java, I just cr turned my string into a character array and did all my manipulations to a character array because I didn't need really awesome functionality like inserting into the beginning, right, or replacing part of it with another part. If you don't need to do those things, then a character array is good enough. The only problem is, is that if you print out a character array, it's not going to automatically be converted to a nice string for the output. You'd have to convert it yourself. So... Stream builders, in my opinion, cool. Anybody have any, any typos? Yeah, let me come and look at everybody's screen. All right, that may be just about enough of the stream builder class. One more thing, and strings actually support a few of these things. Strings have a care at method so that you can pull a character out, right? It has to have that. But it doesn't have the set care at because that changes it and strings are immutable and so they can't be changed. Strings also have a function to search called index of. And so, of course, string builders have to have that function as well. So let's find the position of... What did our uh, last output look like? Is there some good letter we could look for? Let's find the uh, period. Let's find the index of the period. So what I'm going to do is do 
int idx, short for index, is equal to sb dot index of, parentheses, quote, period, end quote. That's cute. That looks kind of like a uh, Japanese-style emoticon. You know, the English tilt all of our faces to the side. And anyways, okay. And, you know, we could add whiskers to it, you know. No, I'm kidding. Okay. All right, all right. There we go. So if IDX is less than zero, it means it didn't find it. Now, we know that period's in there because we know what the data is. But we don't want to rely on the fact that we know what the data is because what if I scroll back up and I, ch and I put that period... You know, if I change it to something else. So we're going to check if IDX is greater than or equal to zero, it's a valid index. And so I'm going to do SB.setCarat or SB.replace. That sounds like a good one. SB.replace, starting at IDX, going to IDX plus one. And I know that looks a little bit weird, but let's, let's roll with it. And like that. I should have just used uh, set care at, right? Why does it have to be IDX, comma, IDX plus one? Because if they were the same number, it would be a length of zero. And there's nothing to replace there, right? Because this is the first one, and this is the one past the position you want to change to. So starting at IDX and going up to, but not including the next one. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Anyways, trust me, if you put IDX and IDX, it wouldn't work. But maybe we would want to use set caret because this syntax, although cool, if we're only changing one character, we may as well use the clean syntax. I don't know. I'll comment that out. It's a little ugly. That's, we're not doing Python. We're doing that. And sb dot set care at idx comma and we're going to make it an exclamation point. Now set care at wants characters. Notice that I use quotes up here because index of is looking for strings, and you can look for a long string. You can look for the entire word ha if you wanted to, right? You just type in ha there. But set care at only wants a single character. And remember that the way you define characters is with single quotes and with strings, double quotes. Different than Python, where you can use those interchangeably and they don't care. Okay. And print it out one more time. Then we'd be done with String Builder, I believe. All right. Yeah, it changed the period. To an exclamation point. Neat stuff. Something you could not do with a string. Yeah, you could get the index of it, but you could not replace it like that. Now, what you might be tempted to do, and I've done this until I glommed onto the fact that there was a string builder class, is to write my own string class, right? And when you created a string, what did it do? It turned into a character array. And then I could put a replace method and a set care at and a get care at, right? I, and I, I added, you know, some of those things, the things that I needed. And, of course, I did not fluff it out. Well, not fluff it out. I did not fully power it up the way this one is, right? I did not do replace and, you know... If you want to look for the last element rather than the first one, you use last index of, right? Like, say we have a whole bunch of periods. If we want to find the first one, you use dot. If you want to find the last one, then you use last index of. What if you need to start at a specific position? You want to skip the first 10 characters and then find the index of past that. I believe you can do that. I believe you can specify a starting spot, right? Uh, I'm going to skip the first four characters. No, nope. what do you know? SB dot index of there it is. From index, I, I just have them in the wrong order. Right, so I want to start off skipping the first four characters before I do that. I could do it like that. 
So index of searching strings is a common thing to do, just like searching lists is a common thing to do. So of course they give you a way to find the first element, the last element, or to step through it ignoring certain parts of it. Why would you want to ignore certain parts of it? What if you had, what if you were processing something like XML, HTML, and your data looked kind of like this? Yeah. And you wanted to, you wanted to process it, you wanted to itemize it, you wanted to get and print out the word hello, and then you wanted to print out the word goodbye. Well, what you could do is you could write a loop. You know, start position equals zero. And then you could do, you know, while. Tell you what, we're going to do start position is equal to sb dot index of, and we're looking for a less than sign. And then while start position is still, what is index of going to return if it doesn't find it? Negative, Negative one. So while start position is greater than or equal to zero, do something with that, right? Look for the other one, right? So the last position is equal to sb dot index of this but starting at our start position. Because, right, once we find one of these, we want to only search things after that. And yeah, for the first one, it makes sense that way. But what if there was a thing like that? Well, that'd be some kind of syntax there, but we wouldn't want to, you know, our program to malfunction. So when we get our start position, we search for that. Right, we have that. And then when we do a search for that, we have that. But that one might return a negative as well. So let's do that. If, you know, last pause is greater than or equal to zero, we have good data. We would get a substring. And there is a substring method of the string builder class. You know. And so, you know, our word is equal to sb.substring. And I'm not sure of the exact syntax, but you're going to get the idea. Start, pause, comma, end pause, right? Give me the substring that's only those two characters. And if you wanted to skip the less than, then you would actually do start pause plus one, right? And then end pause, I'm pretty sure that that would go up to, but not including that position, just like all the other times we've seen that kind of function. And then we could print the word out, right? Print word. And then we would need to find our new starting position, which is just index of again. So start pause is equal to sb dot index of, I want to find another one of these, but I want to start at my last position, right? So once I find, you know, that, that start pause, and then I'm going to find last pause, which is that, I'm going to extract hello and print it out, and now I'm going to look for the next one of these following that one, skipping everything from there to there and it would find it. And so that would be our new start pause. It would loop. It's still greater than or equal to zero, so we would look for the greater than sign. We still have one, and so last pause would be greater than or zero. It would extract that. And if there was any more data after that, it wouldn't print it out. If there was another close bracket like that, it would print it out. It wouldn't print anything out. If there was a open angle without a close angle, right? The only things that this loop would ac accurately pick up would be, you know, the things that are properly formatted with the angle braces around it, and the rest would be considered garbage. Now, maybe you don't want to consider that garbage. Maybe you want your program to fail when it hits bad data. Or, you know, just whatever, you know, whatever your goal is. So, would this work if I copied and pasted into my Java program? Probably not, you know. Um, I'm not sure of the substring syntax. Some versions of substring give you a starting position and then you specify how many characters you want. Like, so start pause, comma, five would give you start pause and then five characters past that. I forget what languages do it like that. I think C Sharp does it like that. And I think Java does it the other way. I guess I could find out real soon, huh?
let's system out dot print line sp dot sub string at position three going out to position up to but not including position 13. And there we go. Dubai, ha. Huh? And that makes sense because position three, that's zero, that's one, that's two, that's three. So D is three, and we're going to go up to but not including 13. So that's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And that's exactly what it did. If we check, it was supposed to go up to, but not including 13, so it got that to that. Do we care enough to get that code working? Why not? Yeah, y'all weren't typing along with me. I'm not going to make you type it now. This is an example of parsing data. There's another term for that. When you're extracting valid pieces of data from a larger set of data, anybody have a good term in mind for that in your programming discipline of choice? Extracting. Extracting is an okay term. I'm trying to think of one in particular. Itemizing, that's not right. That got it. It's one we use in C sharp all the time. Tokenizing. That's what it's called. One thing that it's called. But tokenizing is generally just splitting something up, not searching for things in an extracting. So I like extracting. Alrighty, I think that's about enough about the string builder class. <coughs> I think I'll copy this and just paste it in as notes in my version of it. Nah, nah. I'm not going to do that. I'll leave it like that. So, back to our PowerPoint. Arrays of objects. I touched upon this on our last lecture. You can have arrays of anything. If you declare an array of objects, what you get are a whole bunch of spots with nulls in them. And I can't quite simulate that here but we could print it out and prove that. So go back to your code and up at the top or the bottom or something like that. Strings are objects. So we could create strings or we could go and we could create our own class, we tend to do. You can create a class right there inside your method. And so I'm gonna be stupid and put it there. Class, you know, point. And I'm going to add a constructor. And what should I really do? I should cut all this out and put it in its own file. So class point, it's going to have two elements. Int x, comma y. And it's going to have a constructor to set those. So public. What is a constructor? It's a method that has the same name as a class with no return type. So public point, and it's going to take int space x, comma, int space y. And what is that going to do? It's going to set this dot x equal to x, and this dot y equals y. This dot x equals x. This dot y equals y. That's good enough. We have a custom constructor. When you create your point, you have to provide those values because we no longer have a default constructor. If I wanted to provide a default constructor, it would be pretty easy. All I would have to do is copy that line, but take out the parameters like this. Take out the parameters and then just put some empty braces because it doesn't need to do anything. Now, every object, every class you make has a default constructor, but the compiler removes it. 
if you have a custom constructor, a parameterized constructor. So that's why I added it back. Or maybe it should just set x and y equal to zero, right? Now, honestly, it defaults to x and y being zero anyways, but I could put x equals zero and y is equal to zero inside the braces, but I'm just going to leave it like that to prove the point that it does absolutely nothing. All right, now all point is going to do, that's enough. That's enough to, to serve our purposes. Let's create an array of points, and let's print them out. Well, let's create a single point first and print it out. I'm going to do my trick of collapsing some space. I know it makes it harder to read, but I think we already typed it all in before I did that. All right. So point P1, let's print it out. And we're going to be printing several things, so you may as well cut and paste the word system.out.println. Print out P1. Oh, and what do you know? It's telling me that I can't do that because it's not initialized. I have not created a point. All I have is a reference for it. It's an uninitialized reference, so that fails. I can't do that. I'm going to comment that out. Now I'm going to allocate it. P1 is equal to new point, and its x and y values are 5 and 6. Now let's print it out. System.out.println P1. It's going to print something stupid looking. It's just going to print the name of the class and some kind of hashed version of its memory address, its identifier. Yep, and so when it printed it out, all I did is print the name of the class. It's in the lecture package. There's the package name. There's the class name. There's the name of the variable. No. The lecture name, the class name, and since we put a class inside of a class like idiots, it's also printing that class name out, and then it's printing the hashed version of the uh, memory index that it is. That's dumb. I wanted to actually print out the data. I want it to print out that it's a point and that it's got two values. To do that, I need to add a toString method. And when I say add, I actually mean override. We're overriding the existing toString method. When we printed this out, what the compiler replaced it with, don't type this, is p1.toString to convert it to a string to be printed. But the results of that conversion are pretty ugly. It's just, you know, all that bunch of gibberish. So let's add a toString method to our point class. Public string, now two string is a lowercase t, capital S. Two string, oh, and I forgot to capitalize string here. That's what I get for switching between C++ and Java. There we go, and C sharp. There we go, public string, two string, parentheses in parentheses, curly brace, and we're going to return string.format. I'm going to just put the parentheses and the end parentheses in the semicolon, but of course I'm going to put some stuff between those parentheses. Quote, point, parentheses, percent D, comma, percent D, in parentheses. And then after the quote, comma, X, comma, Y. Or if you prefer, this dot X, comma, this dot Y. Now it's going to look prettier when I print it out. All right, so when I printed it out, it now gives me the name. Yo, I'm a point, and my values are 5, 6. I could make it fancier. I could say, you know, x equals that, and y is equal to that. Now when I run it again, it'll print that information out. That's the point of adding a two-string method. So if for debug purposes or something like that, you want to save it to a file or something like that, then you have an easy way of getting the data in a presentable format.
So one of my recommendations, remember Professor Thompson's recommendations for building classes, and they were things like data private. Notice I really didn't do that. Um, what's the next one? Members, public, you know, ad setters. Really, you only need to add setters if you need to preserve the integrity of the data, right? That's the point of encapsulating the data. But if you're going to make your data private, you better add getters and setters. Add a constructor if it makes using the class easier. And what do I mean by that? If I did not have my two constructor here, so that I could call it like that, I would have to go and add some setters, and I would make a point, and then I'd have to do p1.setx and p1.sety, right? You know, so there'd be a lot of changes. It's kind of nice just to be able to do it like that. All right, and now we're going to add a new one. Add a toString method. If you ever need to display the a representation of the object. So I'm going to just change it to add a two string method if it helps, right? I just about always do it so that, you know, if I'm debugging, I can just do print p1 and it gives me some good information about it. So it usually helps. Even if you wind up not using it in your final one, it certainly can be a useful tool mm -hmm. during the debugging process. All right, and of course, rule zero is classes should have an uppercase name. Class names should start with a capital. That's Java's rules. That's not Mr. Thompson's rules. And if you watch that one video, you know, the habits of annoying programmers or ineffective programmers or whatever, and they talk about, you know, just doing stuff, you know, by rote, not because, you know, it actually serves any purpose, but, you know, what do they call it? Cargo cult programming or something like that. You don't have to do all this stuff. You don't need to make getters and setters for a class, you don't have to add a constructor. You know, one tendency that programmers tend to do is they create an entire framework when it's unnecessary, right? They over implement. Well, I'm gonna have a point class, well great, then I'm also gonna provide a method that'll calculate the distance between the two points, right? That's cool, but what if your application doesn't care about the distance between the two points, then don't create that. You know, don't go and add a whole bunch of things just on the off chance that later on you may need it. But it's easy to add a toString method. So go ahead and add one of those. As far as doing a constructor, if it makes using a class easier, yeah, I'll do that. But you know, if a class has like 30 different instance variables in it, then you're not gonna wanna do this, right? You, you probably are not gonna wanna do patient P1 is equal to new patient, you know, and then fill in 30 different fields, right? Joe Bob, you know, and he lives in, you know, 123 South Main, right, in Midway City. Right. You, you probably won't want to fill in all the data. Maybe you do. But then what happens later on when you start adding even more fields, even more instance members to the P1 class? You've got to then go and modify your constructor, right, to accept even all the additional pieces of data. So... It's not always appropriate to add a parameterized constructor, but if it makes it easier to use, go for it. All right. All that to set us up for the idea of creating an array of points. So point, square brace in, square brace. I'm going to call it PTA for point array. I don't really like that because C programmers would look at that and think that P stood for uh, pointers, which is very different. So I'm going to call it array P, lowercase, okay, P. array P is equal to new point, and I want an array of three points. Maybe we're 
defining a triangle or something like that. Let's print our points out. System dot, wait, let's use a range base for loop. Okay, for each loop. So for point P colon array P. For every point in our array of points, we're going to system.out.println that point. System.out.println P. And quite often when I demonstrate the range base for loops, the for each loops, I use V for value rather than P. Right. Whatever. That'll do. And it's not going to print much that's useful. It's going to print out four nulls. The reason it's printing out four nulls is this created an array of references. But all of references is a memory address, right? So this creates an array of, th oh, I said four, three. This creates an array of three memory addresses. Those memory addresses are going to be able to hold references to points, but we don't have any points yet. Right? We haven't created any points and stuffed them in there. So they're empty memory addresses, right? They're just some spaces out of memory that are waiting for me to create some objects and then store them into the array. And when I say store the objects into the array, what we're really doing is storing the address of the object into that position of the array. So just like on this slide here, that little spot there is not equal to Jordan 625. That's not what it contains. Instead, it contains the address in RAM of that piece of data. And so once we assign clerks 0 is equal to whatever, then that's just equal to 0, which uh, the language calls null in that context. But once we create an object and assign it into the array, then that value will actually have a, you know, a non-null memory address that we won't see. If we try to print it out, it's actually going to call the objects to string method. So we created an array, but it's just an array of nulls. It's no good. Let's create some points and put them in there. So for int x equals 0, x is less than 3. Now that's lame, isn't it? I should actually get the length of the array, because what if I change 3 to something else? So x is less than array p dot length semicolon x plus plus. Now let's make a new point and just initialize both its x and y values to x. So point p is equal to new point x comma x, just to create some kind of valid data in it. And then array p at position x is equal to that point that we just created. Now we have some references. Now we have some good data. And when you're talking about this kind of stuff, you usually just describe it in slightly inaccurate terms. Now I have an array of objects, right? Not really. That would be like saying, when you're holding a piece of paper, I have a sheet or, or a list of houses. I don't really have a list of houses. I have a list of addresses that tell me where to go get to the house. right? And so an array is not an array of points. It's an array of addresses of points, which are called references. All right, don't want to belabor that too much. But now I'm going to print it out again. So I'm just going to copy that for loop, paste it here, and run it. Now it's not going to print three nulls. It's going to print some good data. Right? And I can change those values because an array is not immutable. Right? Say I want to replace the first one with this one, right? Because I had a cool point up here that had x, you know, 5 and 6. 
So I could come down here and say array p subscript 0 is equal to p1, right? Because that was the name of my very first point that I created. That was equal to 5 comma 6. And then if I print it out again, it's going to say, you know, the first element's going to say x equals 5, y is equal to 6. I'm going to take these braces out. And I'm going to move you know, there. Now I have a shorter one line print statement, right? You don't got to do that, but since space is at a premium on my screen, I'm going to do that. It doesn't have the x and y in it. And so the second time it printed my point array, the first element was equal to our original point, right? The one that with the five, six values. Now, if I'm doing this, if I'm creating a point and the only thing I want to do is stick it into an array, I don't have to do it in two steps. I, this is kind of like saying int x equals 3 and then y is equal to x. Why not just say y equals 3? I'm going to change this a little bit. Maybe I'll comment that out. I don't know. I think it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to take this part right here. And I'm going to do that. Right. And then I'm going to delete that line. Now, you don't have to do that. I'm just illustrating. We don't even have to store the result of the constructor in a temporary variable before we put it in the array. And you'll see that syntax a lot, right? We could use array p subscript 0 is equal to new point, you know, like that. And I could do that to 1 and 2, right? You know, whatever. I wouldn't want to have to use a temporary variable to hold it before each one. I'm going to go ahead and undo the changes here because they're demonstrated down here. And we're about done. No, no, no. I just did. Okay, fine. I don't have the x and y values in. I just said point zero zero instead of point x is zero, y is zero. Ah, I made a little change you didn't get to see me make. See, in your two string method, add that. And add that. I missed that too. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to undo this. Point P is equal to, you know, new point. And then this is equal to that point that I just created. I think that's enough for this lecture, especially since we only have three minutes left. One thing I want to mention is that if you do this, does that thing have a name? Does it have a variable name? Right? No, it doesn't. It's, it's an anonymous object. But we do assign its reference into the array, so it's not like it's gone. So what happened to our original value? Right? We created a point here at element 0 when we did that, but later on we replaced its reference with that one. So whatever happened to that point? Whatever happened to point zero comma zero? Point zero comma zero no longer has anything pointing to it. It no longer has any references. It's called an orphaned object. Just like if you have a house somewhere, but you lose your piece of paper with the address, it's an orphaned house, right? Nothing points to it. It's useless. And a Java garbage collector will come eventually remove, you know, deallocate it, free that memory. Because what if you had a for loop like this that created, you know, 100,000 points in a row, right? And then as soon as you exited the for loop, you wouldn't want those 4,000, you know, points in a row to still be there. Or if the array falls out of scope, right? You don't want all that memory to still be allocated. So the array would be removed. They would suddenly become orphan references, and a job in the garbage collector would fix them up. That's about enough of that. Are there any questions? I love waiting until the last minute to ask that because you don't have enough time. But I'm always.
always willing to talk for the next few minutes. Right, let me make the drop box and then I'll ask again, are there any questions? Any questions over the projects? Uh, wave your hand if you've mentally chosen a project. Anybody mentally chosen a project? What do you mean by that? Like, which, yeah, you have a good idea of which one you're gonna do. Um, yeah, so two of you haven't chosen a project yet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Y'all need to pick one pretty soon because they're due right in December. So we have about four weeks left to do them, including Thanksgiving. You might not want to work on Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving to do that. I'm going to take the whole week of Thanksgiving and write that thing out. Well, that'll work. You know, some people don't want to do a thing on Thanksgiving. Others want to, you know, <laughs> utilize that time to be productive. All righty. So Java, la di da di da Looks like I have some things I need to grade. Our daily assignment list has got some ungraded stuff, and I'm sure some of the last programs to do aren't graded. Those will be that will be corrected quickly. UV 